looks like we're good to go. First and foremost, I just want to uh, thank you, Val and Simon, for uh, flipping everything around and giving me an opportunity to uh, have this conversation here with you today. Um, I was given the title of the talk of Mosaicism, a Natural Phenomenon of the Human Embryo. Uh, knowing its existence enhances its outcome, or enhances IVF outcome. And what I really want to drive home today, um, no matter what your opinion on the topic is, whether you believe in it or not, whether you think we should be transferring them or not, what I really want to uh, drive home is that instead of running away from these embryos, we need to run towards them because we can learn a lot of information from them. So if you get nothing else, else out of the talk, I really hope you, you take that away. So just an outline, uh, we'll go over a basic overview. Um, we'll talk about PGS technologies and then really get into mosaicism detection with high resolution in GS. Um, and then look at some clinical data that we've gathered from Genesis Genetics, um, and then also sort of look at some of the research we have been working on um, to better understand what's happening in these embryos. So first off, a very basic definition of mosaicism, uh, and that would be the uh, presence of two distinct cytogenetic cell lineage, or populations of cells in an, in an individual derived from a single fertilized oocyte. So as you have seen in Dr. Hughes' talk um, earlier, you have uh, two populations of cells. You might have one normal population and a monosomic population or a normal population and a trisomic population. The key is you have two different cell types. So how does this originate? Uh, mosaicism originates due to an error in mitosis. Now normally, and this is a very uh, basic view here, Normally, you undergo DNA replication and cell division, uh, and you get two daughter cells that have uh, the same chromosomal complement. Uh, you can have non-disjunction, which is one form of error that leads to mosaicism, where you get DNA replication, but during cell division, one of the chromosomes does not seg uh, segregate evenly, and you end up with a daughter cell that has a trisomy and a daughter cell that has a monosomy. Uh, additionally, you can have anaphase lag where you have DNA replication and when uh, cell division begins, one of the chromosomes lags behind and is, is eventually lost um, during the cell division process, resulting in a daughter cell that has um, monosomy and a daughter cell that has uh, a euploid uh, chromosome complement. So why do we see mosaicism so often in pre-implantation embryos? Um, mitosis is unique during the cleavage stage of these embryos. You, you are undergoing a very rapid cell division, and that's because you have even partitioning of, a cell, uh, of the cytoplasm in those cells, and so you don't uh, have cell growth occurring during this time point. You also have very lax cell cycle checkpoints that you would normally have in later stages uh, of development during mitosis. And you also have increased chromosome instability. So based on all of this, it's really reasonable to expect that mosaicism in pre-implantation embryos is actually a very common occurrence. So looking at the technology and sort of how we are defining mosaicism now, there are a few things that really matter. First off is the time point of the biopsy. Obviously at day three, um, most people take one blastomere and you can't detect mosaicism in a single blastomere because you only have one set of chromosomes. Now, in order to do that, you would have to take a second blastomere and see a different result than what you saw in the first blastomere, and then that would uh, suggest to you that in that embryo you had two distinct cell populations. At day five, day six, when you take a blastocyst biopsy, if done properly, you end up with a number of cells, and from there you can actually see two distinct cell populations within a single biopsy of tissue. Now, technology also matters. The QPCR for PGS um, is a, uh, less, uh, a lower resolution technology where you not, can't necessarily see uh, mosaicism. ACGH is a very good technology, and you can see mosaicism, but there is a lot of variation in the assay in ACGH, and, and there are uh, certain technical aspects that can, can uh, fluctuate the quality of the data. And, and so if you have a good run, you might see very clearly mosaicism, but if you have a poor, uh, poor run, then maybe it's a lot harder to distinguish. Um, but the take home there is you know, there's a lot more variation. With high resolution NGS, you get a lot more data. Um, the, the actual protocol is much more robust, um, much less variation. You're not comparing um, to a reference hybridization. You're comparing to the human genome. Uh, and so it just allows for a, a much better look at what's actually going on uh, in, these, in, in these biopsies. 
so just to write home, there are a lot of people um, that have been, you know, that, that don't want to know mosaicism, that have been saying, okay, instead of moving to the new best technology, we want to stay um, with the current accepted technology of ACGH. Because with ACGH, you can't see mosaicism. And I would challenge them to say, you can see mosaicism. And, and for the reasons I discussed before, it's just a little bit more difficult. And it's a lot more difficult to quantify. Because when, when mosaicism is reported, or when, when the profile is reported in with the ACGH, it's based on a log base 2 scale. Now, there's a calculation you can do to get an idea of how mosaic the embryo is. But it's not near as exact as what you can see with, with high resolution NGS. So just looking at this profile here, the, the first quality metric you look at when you're doing ACGH is how good, uh, or how good is the X separation. So you see here, you have very good X separation. Um, and X separation is how far, whether it's male or female. If it's male, when you compare it to um, the female reference, you see uh, a drop in X as you, because you only have one copy. If it's female, when you compare it to the male reference, you see an increase in X. So here you have a fe uh, female embryo, and so you can see when this, uh, when you look at the X separation here, you have an increase in the X chromosome, and so based on this, you would say, okay, we need to see how far the aneuploidy is. Is it the same distance from from the from the center line as the as the X chromosome? And in this case, you can see for this chromosome nine, it doesn't make it to um, the whole chromosome change that you see in X. So we would consider this mosaic. Now this particular embryo down here, the monosomy 9, does indeed make it to the same level of your uh, X chromosome, of your X separation, and so this would be considered a meiotic abnormality. Now, if you have uh, an assay where you don't get near as, as much resolution because you had a poor reference hybridization, you can see that with this X separation, things get a little bit more hairy. This X separation is now much closer to the, the baseline here. And so, although this embryo is mosaic and you can sort of see that, it's much more difficult for you to pick that out when you're going through and reading data than, say, if I go back, when you have very high quality X separation and you can see very clearly that this is a mosaic embryo. So, you can detect mosaicism with ACGH. It's just a bit more difficult and less consistent. So with next generation sequencing, uh, you get the largest data set of any PGS technology. Um, we have seen resolution of detection has been validated internally to five uh, megabases, and that publication is in development. And this uh, technology provides us with the ability to de uh, detect segmental aneuploidies and also the ability to detect and quantify mosaicism within a single biopsy. Now, I do want to stress that this is within a single biopsy. So how do we really internally look to see if what we're seeing in the NGS is, is real in terms of mosaicism? So uh, what we did is we took two very beautiful profiles. It doesn't get much better than either one of these um, from two separate WGA, uh, whole genome amplified material uh, from blastocyst biopsy. And what we did is we quantified the DNA, diluted it to equal concentrations, and then we just did a simple mixing experiment where we took 90% of Euploid DNA, 10% of the aneuploid DNA, and we just did that by 10% increments all the way. So we got a good idea from 10 to 90% mosaicism what the data should what what the data should look like. And I'll just quickly uh, click through here so that you can uh, get a good idea of, of what we saw. So the first slide is uh, 10, would be 10% mosaicism for minus six plus 18. You don't really see much difference here, so I would say that this is not within our limit of detection. We get to 20%, and here on 18, you can start to see some uh, some movement uh, on the y-axis, and you can also, because we mixed female and male, you can start to see the the X chromosome is starting to come closer to one copy, and the Y chromosome now is no longer zero, and it's starting to get closer to uh, one copy as well. Now, when we get to 30%, this is much clearer. Here, it's more difficult, and we could say that some technical noise could contribute to these differences if you didn't know that you were uh, mixing euploid and aneuploid DNA. But here, I think it gets a lot harder. You can again see the X chromosome sinking down and the Y chromosome. So I'll just go through quick, quickly. This is 40% mosaic, 50% mosaic, 60% mosaic, 70, 80, and 90. And so you can see the power of the technology and its ability to really detect these mixtures um, within within the DNA samples. Now I know uh, 
re more recently, um, Santi and also Francisco have done studies looking at actual cell sorting where they sell sorted out euploid cells and aneuploid cells and mixed, um, you know, sing numbers together, and they saw the same thing with the, with the NGS technology. So clearly, um, what we're seeing is not an artifact of the sequencing technology. So uh, from there, I want to get into the, the clin clinical observations we have seen at Genesis Genetics uh, that are related to mosaicism. And it's important to note that um, not everybody reports mosaicism the same or uh, assesses mosaicism the same. For instance, uh, our data set does not include complex abnormal uh, embryos. Uh, in some instances, when you're dealing with uh, a number of chromosome abnormalities um, within, the tech, within the software, you can start to lose some of the, uh, normal, uh, the accuracy of the normalization act algorithm and what might be 10 meiotic aneuploidies uh, in a complex abnormal embryo actually begin <laughs> actually uh, begin to look uh, mosaic because they don't normalize well. So with that being said, um, we see clinically at, at Genesis Genetics, and this is across 15,000 biopsies, uh, a total uh, mosaicism rate of about 18.4% of embryos, so one in five embryos. Now, not all of these mosaics are created the same, so about 4.7% of the time, this mo a mosaic abnormality is associated with another meiotic abnormality. So in terms of clinically, you wouldn't transfer this embryo anyway because it has a, a meiotic abnormality. Um, about 9% of the time, you see medium to high level mosaicism where it's very clear and well defined in the NGS profile. And then about 4 or 5% 5 of embryos, you see uh, more low level uh, mosaicism where it's very clear, but it's still in that range of technical noise that can be difficult to, you know, to rule out. So one of the very important things, is, and this makes a lot of sense, is that mosaicism is not dependent on maternal age. Uh, no matter what group you look at, egg donors, uh, very young patients, and then even advanced maternal age patients here, you see a similar rate of mosaicism across the board. Um, and this is very important because it, it makes sense that age does not necessarily affect mitosis in the same way as it would affect meiosis. Additionally, we do see a lot of variation in mosaicism by individual clinics. So here we have 20 plus clinics. Um, these are all higher volume clinics. So we have tested over uh, 200 embryos now in each one of these clinics, some of them up to 3,000. Um, and we do see a very um, you know, wide distribution in the rate of mosaicism across these clinics. So the red line is the average between all of them. But you can see the lowest we see is about 13.9% of their embryos being mosaic, where one, in, one clinic in general had a mosaicism rate of 27%. So this does beg the question, are there some environmental factors that are contributing, contributing to mosaicism? Usually stimulation cycle, culture conditions, and even biopsy technique could all be uh, environmentally, um, in my, environmental factors that induce you know, some level of mosaicism in embryos. We don't know what those are, and I think it's going to be really important over time to, you know, start understanding some of those uh, characteristics in these in these clinics to see if we can really tease out some of that information. And I know there's already been some work being done on that um, in a group in the, in the UK. So now the big questions uh, that I think is really the the importance of this talk, and that's uh, does mosaicism identified in the trope relate to what's actually found in the entire embryo? And can we draw inference into the viability of an embryo based on how much mosaicism we see in a trophectoderm biopsy? Now, here we have a, a beautiful blastocyst. Now, this is a 2D theoretical model. It's not perfect. This is assuming that all the cells propagate evenly, which we uh, suspect is not the case. Um, but what we have here would be a, a non-disjunction event at the second cleavage stage. So you have one, one very nice cell division, uh, even distribution of the chromosomes, and during the second cell division, one of those uh, cells had a non-disjunction event and resulted in a daughter cell with a monosomy and a daughter cell with a trisomy. So looking at this blastocyst here, you basically have a 50% euploid cells, and you have 25% monosomic population and a 25% trisomic population. Now, if you biopsy this um, particular embryo, or say here, 
you end up with two euploid cells and two monosomic cells. And when you run this out on next generation sequencing, it would look like a 50% mosaic monosomic. But if you biopsy here, and these are all, um, if you biopsy here, you end up with three euploid cells and two trisomic cells. And that's when you run this out on EGS, you would see 40% mosaic trisomy. Now, if you biopsy here, you could definitely end up with four euploid cells. And in this instance, this embryo would re be reported as euploid. So clear, biopsy is a sampling of the embryo. It's not an ideal um, um, assay. Mike, like, as Mark was saying, when you biopsy a tumor, you don't always get the same result twice. Uh, and, and that is uh, true in the, in the trophectoderm of an embryo as well. So, just to get into this a little bit more, there are a lot of people that say the percentage of mosaicism you see in a trophectoderm biopsy doesn't matter. It's either mosaic or it's not. Now, that's very true in terms of the exact percentage of mosaicism in the entire embryo, but can we infer something from this? So, I mean, if you look at this here, I have uh, a non-disjunction event at the first cleavage stage, second cleavage stage, and third cleavage stage, which and again, this is theoretical, assuming all populations uh, propagate in the same manner, which they, they probably don't. If you take a biopsy here, no matter what, you're going to get aneuploid cells. If you take a biopsy in, in this embryo that had a non-disjunction event at the uh, second cleavage stage, you have some populations of euploid cells, but you also have populations of mon uh, monosomic cells and trisomic cells, so there's a good chance you're going to see an aneuploidy in this. Now, if that uh, non-disjunction happens in the third cleavage stage, you get less mosaicism or less, less aneuploid cells, and now you're, you're much more likely to biopsy this and say this is euploid, or you're going to have a much lower percentage of mosaicism in the trophectoderm biopsy. So doing the same thing for anaphase lag, which is, is even diff a little bit more different because you have, uh, I guess, less aneuploid cells depending on where the uh, abnormality occurs. But if you have anaphase lag during the first cleavage stage, you end up with 50% euploid cells, 50% mono monosomic cells, and no matter where you biopsy this, you're more than likely going to get aneuploid cells in that biopsy if you take a big enough if you take a big enough slice. Now, if it happens at the second stage or second cleavage division, you're in, going to end up with a 25% mosaic embryo. And you can see now, if you biopsy here, you might get a monosomy in there. But if you biopsy here, you'll have a euploid. And then even in the third cleavage stage, if you have an anaphase lag event, now you have even less aneuploid cells, and it's much more likely that when you biopsy that, if you see mosaicism in the biopsy, it's going to be a very low percentage. So some of the research we have been working on, basically we identified trophectoderm uh, biopsies by high-resolution next-generation sequencing to be mosaic. We discussed these results with the, with the clinician, and they had a conversation with their patient, and they decided they did not want to transfer these embryos. So they donated these embryos for research. We took the whole embryo. Uh, it was thawed. They tubed it, and they sent it to us in the same buffer that we used for trophectoderm biopsies. And then the whole embryo identities were blinded to us. We tested them via high-resolution next-generation sequencing, and then we documented those whole embryos for mosaicism. So there's trophectoderm in there. There's also ICM. It, it's not a, a perfect model, but it, it tells us information. So when we do this, we did this on 100, 107 trophectoderm whole embryo pairs. And what we see is that about 27.1% of the time, the whole embryo contains a concordant mosaic chromosome that was observed in the original trophectoderm. About 17% of the time, the, the whole embryo is actually a meiotic aneuploidy, but it appeared mosaic in the trophectoderm. 55% of the time, the whole embryo did not exhibit any mosaicism to the naked eye. Now, one caveat here is in a non-disjunction event, you have a monosomic cell population and a trisomic cell population. So if you biopsy six cells and you happen to biopsy three monosomic cells and three trisomic cells, when you do the math, that equals out knock on the microphone. That equals to a euploid embryo, and you would, it would look like that in, in next generation sequencing. So we can't account for that in these euploid embryos, but that is something that you know we definitely understand is a limitation. One per, less than 1% of the time, we actually saw a new mosaic aneuploidy in the whole embryo that we did not observe in the trophectoderm. And that actually sort of surprised us a little bit. We thought we might see that more than, than just 1% of the time, but you know, the data were the data. It only happened once. 
So from there, we went on to look at does the level of mosaicism in the biopsy matter? So if you had a low-level mosaicism in the trophectoderm, when you looked at the whole embryo, 91% of the time that embryo appeared to be euploid, and only 9% of the time did you see um, a concordant aneuploid. If it had a, a medium-level me, medium uh, mosaicism, still about 68% of the time it appeared to be euploid in the whole embryo, and about 30, 32% of the time you saw it concordant aneuploid. But when you got into the high levels of mosaicism that you obse observed in the trophectoderm biopsy, now it was only euploid in the whole embryo approximately 20% of the time, 25% of the time, but 75% of the time you actually saw a concordant aneuploid in the whole embryo relating to, to the trophectoderm. So how does this cl translate clinic? all this information translate clinically? Uh, Fiorentino et al. has so far done the largest study regarding the transferring of mosaic embryos. He's shown that these have a lower rate of implantation compared to euploid embryos, and the clinical pregnancy rate of these transfer mosaics is approximately 33%. And that tells us, along with the other data that we've seen, is not all mosaics are created equal. So just to touch base on this slide before I go uh, to, on to the last piece of data that I have to share, clearly, if it's low-level mosaic, more times than not it's euploid. If it's hot in the whole embryo, if it's a high-level mosaic in the trophectoderm, more times than not it's aneuploid. So at Genesis, we generally call these low-level um, samples that are within our threshold of detection that we feel that are potentially mosaic. We call these euploid. So we have outcome data from this, and we've seen um, this is from a single clinic. These are all frozen, uh, frozen cycles, and these are all single embryo transfers. And we see an implantation rate of around 65%, 67% uh, in clean euploid embryos, and that doesn't uh, change much with low-level mosaics. When you look at ongoing, and these, these numbers are all per transfer, uh, just to, to preface that as well. So this is per embryo transferred. Um, when we look at ongoing re pregnancy per embryo transfer, you do see a bit higher rate in euploid embryos than you do see in low-level mosaics. Uh, the biochemical rate doesn't change, but we do see an increase in spontaneous abortions in these embryos. Now, this is where we have to make a decision on how, how to pick our poison, right? Because clearly these embryos are very viable, and, and they're leading to ongoing pregnancies, but you do increase the number of miscarriages that you have. Uh, and so that's a conversation that, you know, is important to have clinician, patient, what the priority is. But we need to get these data out there so that they have something to use to reference when making those uh, more difficult decisions. So, in conclusion, you know, mosaicism in pre-implantation embryos is real. Not all technologies are created the same with regard to its detection, and not all mosaics are created equal. But right now, we are not at a point where we can really understand this that well, and we, like I said when I started, we, we need to run towards this and not run away from it. So, in terms of continued research, we need to understand some cell lineage analysis. We need to know how these cells propagate. When the embryonic genome takes over, do these cells stop dividing? Do they undergo apoptosis? All likely scenarios, but all not well understood at this point in time in the human embryo. You know, we need to look at individual chromosomes and see, obviously, 13, 18, 21, X and Y, are, you have to be a, a lot more careful with. But we need to understand if there are differences in chromosomes that you know, some just don't ever implant, or some actually always implant and, and have, have no ill effects. And then we also can look at some statistical modeling. If you, if you think back to the, the images of all the trophectoderms and when the non-disjunction events happen, we can do some statistics to really understand what the likelihood, if you see the percentage, of percentage abnormality in a biopsy, potentially where that abnormality happened and what's the likelihood that that embryo is actually going to be viable versus you know, it not being viable. So just in conclusion, I, I really want to drive this home is it's better to know than not to know. Um, people have been transferring, the don't do PGS have been transferring mosaic embryos since the beginning of time, and now we have the technology and the ability to detect this. We need to use it. Um, we need to learn from it. That's all.